So um, chapter 4 uh, picks up where we left off from this morning. Remember the, the exhortation this morning or the encouragement this morning as, as I think Paul was sort of preparing Timothy for what he was about to say in chapter 4. Um, our verses from this morning, in chapter 3, verse 14, I'm writing these things to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I'm delayed that you would know how to conduct yourself in the house of God. So uh, chapter 4 is going to be how to conduct yourself. Like Those are going to be very specific instructions that are coming of how to conduct yourself. But the, the basis or the foundation of how, our, how we conduct ourselves has everything to do with what actually God is doing. You know, why would I conduct myself like this or... Or, or uh, the, what's the basis or what's the underlying reality? Well, the underlying reality is what God has done. It's not my conduct. It's actually what God has done. And that is you could conduct yourself in the house of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. There's some great identity statements that we looked at this morning about the nature of the church. And then this statement about uh, Jesus, verse 16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. So the message of the church is Jesus. He's the one that was manifested. He's the one that was justified. He's the one that's preached. He's the one that's believed in. He's the one that's gone up into glory. He's the one that was seen by the messengers. So that being said, then here's why that's so important. Verse 1, he said, Now the spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith. So the Spirit has made it clear that we should be on our guard because of apostasy. That's the word depart. Um, that's, that's, where we, that's why we use that word in English. We have the word apostasy in English. And apostasy is when somebody once held to something and they've departed from it. It's a departure. So some people who once believed this or held to this, or they were, you thought they were part of it, but now they're not anymore. They've left it. And the Spirit, and it's interesting, Paul, it's translated in English as expressly, but um, you could translate that word as exactly, that the Spirit has spoken in a very direct and specific way that, that we need to be on guard against people leaving the truth. In the last days, you want to be watching out because the Spirit has said, in a, in a very direct way, that there will be a departure from the faith. So um, we're not paranoid about that. We're not running around like chickens with our heads cut off, or we're not trying to find apostasy in every single place. We're just, we want to be aware. The Spirit has told us this. Now, how do we know the Spirit told us that? Well, the inspired Apostle Paul told us that the Spirit said that. <laughs> so um, we're looking for that. We're, we want to be aware of it. And how will they be departing? Well, it's going to have to do with teaching. He says, they're giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So the apostasy is actually going to be coming uh, from evil spirits. Evil spirits who are going to be bringing about deception are going to be bringing about doctrines, and people are going to start to believe those doctrines. Now, that's an interesting thing that he says, because... Uh, where do you think believers are going to hear doctrines? You're a believer. Where do you hear doctrines? On Oprah? Well, Oprah's got a lot of doctrine that she shares. She does. And it's demonic. A lot of it, you know, believe in yourself. It's a very self-centered, whatever. That's a certain kind of doctrine. But when he says to Timothy, the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth, and what he's going to encourage him to do in the next verses it is Paul's concerned that this, these doctrines would make their way within to the context of a congregation, that there would actually be within the congregation, uh, through demonic influence, that there would be doctrines that would be you know, being propagated or taught as true, but they're not true. Now, has that happened? Is that happening right now? If you turn on the main Christian television station, TBN, are you going to only see good doctrine, or are you going to see maybe some good doctrine and maybe a lot of bad doctrine? What's the answer to the question? Well, a lot of bad doctrine. Personally, I can't watch that, that station. I mean, I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't ever watch it. When I do watch it, I always seem to turn it on when some heretic is on. Uh, I remember one time, I think the only time I've watched a whole show was Kenneth Copeland, 
And uh, this was back in the, in the early 90s. Hank Hanegraaff had written his book called Christianity in Crisis. Is that right? Is that what it's called? And he had all these quotes from all these different guys, you know, Morris Cirillo saying that he's God and Benny Hinn saying that God, there was actually nine gods in the Trinity, that each part of the Trinity was a Trinity and he had all this, and Adam used to be able to fly. He had all this really bizarre, and, he, and with, with it, he had all these quotes, and then they had an audio version of the book that actually had the guy's audio quote in, when you listen to the book, it actually, you could hear Benny Hinn's voice, or Morris Cirillo, or Kenneth Copeland, or these different guys, you know, saying these things. It was, it was uh, you know, it had a huge impact in a sense that it uh, that made a lot of people mad, but it didn't stop any of their ministries. Uh, people... People want to believe that God wants you wealthy. People want to believe that. They have an itching ear. You know, they want to hear something. They want to know that, um, that they can write their own ticket. The idea of, a, of the word faith, that you speak it and God has to do it, and, and the twisting of the scriptures. There's a lot of bizarre teaching. And, and, it's, and it's just uh, people flock after it. Um, People, people spend millions of dollars, they give millions and millions of dollars to these guys, um, but they're doctrines of demons. They're not biblical doctrines. And I remember the one time I listened to Kenneth Copeland, I was shocked because uh, it was a half hour long program, and for 25 minutes, the program was really good. I mean, he taught, he taught it wasn't a Bible study, he was kind of just doing his Kenneth Copeland thing, he was, he was just rambling, you know, just talking, but everything he said was really true, and I thought, well, that's not that bad, that's pretty true, that's true. I was, I was like, well, that's true, like, what's the, this guy seems to be telling the truth, and all the way to the end, and in the last five minutes, he said so much heresy, and the way he twisted the scripture, it undid all the good stuff that he said, he just reinterpreted every word that you would, like a biblical word, like if you said faith, he, he, when he says faith, he doesn't mean faith the way this book describes it. Faith, the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. A Hebrews 11 analysis of faith, of, of Moses who rejected the treasures of Egypt so he could endure the reproach of Christ. I mean, it wasn't a biblical. He had, he had attached a whole different meaning so that everything he had said previously, it was all now reinterpreted by this twisting at the end. So if, if someone was listening to that, and they weren't paying attention, you, you, could literally, you would be starting to believe this. And many, many people um, follow these guys and believe what they say. And so we're not surprised by that. We're not surprised that, um, that there would be just large amounts of false teaching. And it, it's a plague to the world. It's really sad that the, so much of this false teaching originates in our country and then is exported around the world. These guys are huge in Africa. Uh, they go to Africa and they, 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 they just basically take so much money from the Africans. It's so sad. Uh, they, they, they take so much money from people who are so poor. It's, it's tragic. When, when they stand before God and are judged, you know, Jesus warned, you know, there's a stricter judgment and uh, I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. Um, these are doctrines that are from deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Just because something spiritual is happening doesn't mean it's God. Many people go to some of these events and there are tremendous emotional experiences. People, you'll see them slain in the spirit. They're falling on the ground. There have been, since I've been a believer, there was a laughing revival. There was barking like a dog revival. There's been slain in the spirit continuously. There's all these, and, and uh, at best, it's just an emotional fervor that people get whipped up into and then they're reacting emotionally. At worst, it might be spiritual. Someone might actually be having something spiritual happen. But according to Paul, this false teaching, and that's not the only kind, there's lots of different kinds, but, but these are deceiving spirits. There could, be a, there could be a spiritual manifestation accompanying the teaching. So for you, as you're living your life as a believer trying to follow Jesus, trying to follow the Word of God, you don't have to be afraid of it because the test is always, what do they say about Jesus? Just listen carefully. What do they say about Jesus? Are they pointing me to Jesus? Are they pointing me to themselves? Are they pointing me to an experience? Or are they pointing me to the cross? You know, what, what is the emphasis? Is it about Jesus or is it not about Jesus? That's how, it's really easy to judge. You don't have to have a PhD or study apologetics to be able to judge it. You can judge it, your spirit. In your spirit, you'll know. You have an anointing from the Holy One and you'll know. Are they teaching me to abide in Jesus? Are they giving me some mumbo jumbo and my flesh is longing for it? And, and so uh, you, you'll be able to discern it 
when, when you experience it or when you see it or someone starts to talk to you about it, but just, just pay attention. You know, don't believe every spirit. First John says that. Don't believe every spirit. Why? Because many false prophets have gone out into the world, he said. So when, some, when there's something spiritual happening, you just look at it and run it through a test. Like, what is this about? Who is this drawing attention to? Is this drawing attention to the guy on the stage or is this drawing attention to Jesus? Is this helping these people get, uh, manipulate these people and get more money from them or is this drawing people closer to Christ? And usually the answer is really easy. You look at that and think, well, that's not about Jesus at all. So uh, there could be very powerful spiritual manifestations because we know the origin of this is going to be spiritual. So that's why, that's why this exhortation needs to be connected with the end of chapter 3 and Paul's going to tell Timothy how he wants him now to act in light of, here's what's going to be happening. There's the church of God, the church of the living God, the household of God, and it's the pillar and the ground of the truth. And the Spirit has told us in the last days that people are going to, want to, they're going to leave the truth. And so what should you do then? Here's what God's doing. Here's what Satan's going to be doing. So, Timothy, I want you to, to be standing firm in the Word. So this doctrines of demons and then here's what paul was concerned about he gets a little specific of what to watch out for verse two there's gonna this is hypocrisy they're speaking lies in hypocrisy which means these guys know that they're lying hypocrisy is a word that uh was part of the culture and and it describes an actor it's somebody pretending to be something that they're not you know uh i was walk we were walking through the airport yesterday and there was an ad with with uh, Johnny Depp, and it was for some fragrance, I think it was a, a Johnny Depp uh, cologne. I forget what it's called, but it's a picture of him. And uh, see, I, I, you know, I remember Johnny Depp when he first came up. He didn't look like he looks right now. When he first came up, he kind of had like a more of a clean cut look. He didn't have any tattoos. He didn't look like a pirate. Uh, but, but what Johnny Depp has done is he's created a persona. Like, well, who's the real guy? Was it the guy on you know, back in the day when he was on the TV show, or is it this guy now who's part, you know, pirate, part musician, or like whatever he, but it's just an, he's an actor. He's pretending to be something. And, and in the Greeks, when they put on a play, the actors would wear masks. So all the parts were played by men, there weren't women, so the women parts, so the guy has a woman's mask, and so the, the person who's a hypocrite is a, a mask wearer. Is somebody who's pretending to be something that they're not. They have, a, they have a facade. So listen, when these guys say, oh, we're believers, or we're this, they're like, yeah, no, you got, but behind, what's behind the mask? They're, he says they're speaking lies in hypocrisy. These guys know that they're lying. They know it. Um, the, and listen, what's happened when you speak lies in hypocrisy and you live like that? Look at the end of verse 2. Having their own consciences seared with a hot iron. It's, could Paul have said that more graphically? Their conscience seared as with a hot iron. It would, what would happen to your flesh, your, your skin, if you took a hot iron and you seared your skin? What would happen to it? It would just become burned. And what would, what would happen as you healed from the burn? You'd just become calloused and hard. And so their conscience, that should be tender and soft, because they're pretending to be something that they're not and they're lying repeatedly, what are they doing to their conscience? And so there's no conviction that the conscience becomes leathery. You know, you just look at this. It's a, it's a really graphic picture. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. And what do they do? Now, this is really interesting. Verse 3, forbidding to marry. Now, you'd say, well, that doesn't fit with our current version of the false prophet. Uh, there's not this particular teaching. But in church history, is there a group that says if you really want to be righteous, I mean, the only people who really aren't righteous are the people who are unmarried. Is there a group? Can you guys think of a group that says if you want to be used by God, you need to stay unmarried? Like if you're a woman and you really want to be used by God, you need to be unmarried? Or if you're a man and you really want to be used by God, you need to stay unmarried? Is there a group? Probably. You can think of one. There might be a billion people who follow that. Um, Paul says... That's a doctrine of demons. Now, we've recently uh, had a lot of expose in, from the media about one of the byproducts of having the for, 
the prohibition from marriage and what the consequences are to the church that has bought into that lie. And what's one of the consequences? Children being abused. And if you just think about, like, since that doctrine became part of that church, how many children have been abused over the centuries? I mean, I wonder, I wonder what the number is. I know God knows the number. I know every young person who's ever been molested, God knows exactly who they are and what they've been through and cares about them and loves them. And, and what, a, what a horrible thing to, to be in a place where, uh, you know, you have such an opportunity to influence somebody and to, and to just hurt them so dreadfully. It's just so sad. So forbidding to marry. And also commanding to abstain from foods. So here's another doctrine that Paul would put in as a doctrine of demons to say, if you really want to be right with God, you need to not eat for this period of time or not eat this certain food. Do you, do you know of any group that has a period of time where they say, we're not going to eat any of this kind of food for this season or for this period? Is it, isn't it, it doesn't even have a name, right? And even sometimes I, I've known believers who say, well, I'm doing this for Lent. And I always think to myself, why don't you just eat it for Lent and be thankful while you eat it? I mean, what's the, with, I mean if you're going to fast to humble yourself and seek the Lord, that's one thing. But for a religious observance, like, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to abstain from foods because somehow that's going to create value. Uh, like, Jesus said, you eat whatever you want. He made all foods clean. Now, I, I don't know that I like all foods, uh, having especially just been in Asia, where... Uh, they really enjoy the liberty that Jesus has given. Um, and I have a good friend who, who uh, just, he's one of those guys that kind of is cut to be sort of on the mission field. And he, he pastors a church in Southern California, but he would show me a video. He'd go, oh, we were just in the, the night market in Chiang Mai, and we ate this and this and this. And he goes, you want to see a video? I'm like, dude, I don't need it. Like, no. He ate, uh, uh, Dora and Caesar will know this, he ate the, fertilized eggs, you know, that you get with the, I think there, is it duck or chicken that, what's it called? I've never had that and I won't. I know Jesus said it's clean, but, um, you know, but some people, Paul, Paul calls it a doctrine of demons. So here, for our own congregation, if someone ever starts attending and they tell you, oh, you guys, you shouldn't eat that. They're like, well, what do you mean I shouldn't eat that? You can eat whatever you want. I mean, personally, since Jesus made, Jesus made it clean, I wonder if Jesus was thinking of carnitas when he made it clean or bacon. And you're like, you know, it, he declared all foods clean. There was a purpose for Israel, for the food laws, for uh, their own national identity, and for their own health. Um, but Jesus, it's Jesus who said, it's not what comes out of, or, you know, it's not what goes into the man that defiles a man, it's what comes out of the man that defiles the man. Because what you eat goes in and passes through. He said, but out of the, out of the heart comes these other things. And this, again, it comes back to the speaking in the hypocrisy. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. So, um, all, so it's gonna, like Paul specifically refers to forbidding the marriage and then saying you need to abstain from foods, which I think is fascinating in light of uh, the, ch the Catholic Church's teaching over the centuries, you know, that uh, every single year in the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus is tied to a period of fasting and, and that and there's an abstinence. And it's not, a, it's not a fasting abstinence like the Bible, when the Bible does talk about fasting, it's a, it's a different thing. It has a different meaning. So anyway, just throw that out there. It's interesting that Paul said that hundreds of years before that really became part of, of, a, of a doctrine within a part of the church or, or somebody declaring to be part of the church. And then Paul talks about food, just very briefly. He said, food, now notice verse 3, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So God made the food, so go ahead and eat it. Don't worry about it. And then verse 4, every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it's received with thanksgiving. Now, I love it that as he says that, and maybe he's had to eat some things he didn't want to eat, because verse 5, I've, I've always appreciated that he said that. For it's sanctified by the word of God in prayer. I've eaten some food that I'm pretty sure was not sanctified except by the word of God. And please, Lord, we're praying for you to sanctify this food before we eat it. Um, so there, there's your teaching on food. What did Paul say about it? When someone says you can't eat it or you know, you're less righteous or I'm more righteous because I don't, 
all right? I, abstinence of food is a certain thing that's going to create more stature for me or value, like or I've got some in, more righteousness that I've gained by my own fasting or whatever. Paul said, no way. Everything is good. That includes those giant snails in Ghana that they are standing at the side of the road with this big platter. You don't eat those in Etie. You love those. Oh, great. <laughs> See, I guess it depends upon where you, were, where you grew up. I have some great friends. They love those. And so I always say, well, whenever they serve me, you can have mine. So I won't tell them no. I'll just say, and then you sit right next to me, and then you eat mine for me. Uh, I have a really good friend, uh, Apia, in Ghana who loves snails, and, uh, and he'll have my back. But, you know, you're, stand, you're driving by the side, and these are snails that are bigger than any snail you could imagine. You don't know a snail could grow this big. I'm not exaggerating. They're big, and then they got a, the tray at the side of the road because they get them out of the bush, and, and they usually are, you know, they just find them, and then, and then they sell them at the side of the road. There's a platter with 15 or 20 of these things just crawling all over, and, oh, it's just, oh, so gross. So, I mean, Paul said, hey, every creature's good. Nothing's to be refused, Rich. If it's received with thanks, I guess it's received with thanksgiving, so I'm not thankful. So I guess it ain't good then. I don't know. I got to get out of this somehow. But it's sanctified by the word of God in prayer. That means you could eat it. It's not going to make you more righteous or less righteous. Fasting, when we, when we do fast, fasting does not make us more righteous. It has nothing to do with us being more righteous. It has nothing to do with our position before God. We are declared righteous How? By the blood of Jesus Christ. Our sins are taken away. We're given righteousness by putting our faith in Jesus. You can't get more righteous than you are right now. You're as righteous as you'll ever be. Now you might say, I want to grow. I want to be more righteous. Yeah, well, you're going to grow. You can grow as the Spirit's working in your life. You're changing. You're growing. But you're standing before God as a gift of God through your faith in Jesus Christ. So then why do we fast? What does fasting do? Fasting is a discipline that we, we participate in, and it's connected with prayer. And what happens when you fast is you are denying your flesh something, and what happens is your flesh is then provoked, and you quickly realize that you're pretty much in the flesh all the time. Once you start fasting, you realize, my body tells me what to do, and I just do it. My body will say, eat that. And I, don't, I just go, okay, and I, I'm done. I think, oh, I probably shouldn't have eaten that. Um, and then I have another one. And I think, oh, I really shouldn't have that, too. If you, had, you shouldn't have had one, why have to, uh, two? I've, I've already done it. Might as well have three. I mean, the, the flesh, when you start to tell it no, then you start to enter into, oh man, and you're, you're being humbled, and, and you're, being, you're, you're making yourself aware, and then you take that and turn it into prayer. And it's a spiritual discipline that, that humbles us, and, and it, it does affect us. It doesn't affect God. God's not looking at us and being, I wasn't going to say yes, but look at you, go, so now I will. God wants to bless. He wants to work. Fasting affects me. It humbles me and shows me how dependent I am on God. And in that state, I pray much more effectively. <laughs> it affects me and draws me into an awareness of, of my need for God. And, and that's good for me. But it doesn't make me better than you or different from you. It doesn't have any effect on that at all. So um, we can eat whatever we want. It may not be healthy for you, but uh, it won't make you unrighteous. Now, verse 6, we're getting back to this context of the, the encouragement so that you know how to conduct yourself. So, so know this, how to conduct yourself. The identity of the church, the church is the pillar of ground of the truth. The Spirit has warned us exactly or specifically, directly, that people are going to fall away. So, verse 6, if you then instruct the brethren in these things, you'll be a good minister of Jesus Christ. So Timothy's ministry is going to be instructing the believers. And what's he going to instruct them about? Well, that in the last days, there's going to be deceiving spirits that are going to be moving and seeking to draw people away into false doctrines. And so teach the people, teach them. The minister of Jesus Christ primarily is going to be teaching people what the Word of God says. That's the primary ministry that prayer and the ministry of the word. In Acts chapter 6, when there was the grumbling amongst the believers where the, the widows who followed the Greek culture felt like they were being uh, treated unfairly and they less favorably than the, the widows who followed the Hebrew culture. And so they started, there was a complaining going on and, and how would they distribute the food to these poor widows. 
And so the apostles called the people together and said, look, we're not going to leave the word of God to wait on tables. So choose seven guys and we'll point them over that. They can focus on that ministry. We'll give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And why was that? Well, it's because of this. That's what a good minister does. A good minister is going to primarily be spending most of their energy on prayer and the ministry of the word. If a minister spends all of his time going to the hospital and visiting people, which is very important, if a minister spends all of his time fixing the lights in the sanctuary or washing the windows or doing whatever, there's a lot of work that could be done. And if, I, if I'm the pastor and I'm spending all of my energy doing everything except for preparing the word of God to, to minister the word of God to people, well, then the church is going to suffer. So God, God will raise up other people to do lots of other ministries, things that have to happen, so that, so that there's someone within the congregation. It doesn't have to be me. It could be whoever. But somebody within the congregation or several within the congregation, as it grows, that will be able to focus on ministering to everybody else. They're gifted by God. They're called by God. And the purpose of their ministry is to nourish the congregation and bring the word of God, to um, teach them, instruct them. You'll be a good minister of Jesus Christ. Verse 6 continues, Nourished in the words of faith, and of good doctrine, which you have carefully followed. So Timothy already has been proven. He's been discipled. He he himself has received the words of faith. They've worked their way into his life, and now he's, he's he's been equipped, and now he can be used by God to help the people in Ephesus and minister to them. And that's one of the things that was so encouraging to me about being at this conference just two weeks ago in Thailand was... Several guys that I've known for many years, um, two of the guys I've known since they were in high school. Um, one of the guys I've known, I met him when he was still kind of backslid. I met him right as he was getting his life right with the Lord. He's 15 years old. Well, now he's planted one of the best churches that Calvary Chapel has in Brazil, turned it over to uh, Celso, uh, who's now the pastor. Is this a really thriving ministry, a great church, and moved from there to a country in Asia where he's He's doing new ministry there, and uh, God just using that guy so much. And, and so just seeing, like, here's a guy, I, I got to watch him get discipled, and now God's taken that guy and sent him to two different countries. He's got two, you know, two, a thriving ministry that he's turned over to somebody, now he's in another country doing exactly the same thing again. And so that's kind of like what happened with Timothy. Timothy, you've been nourished up in these sound words, and you've received this, and so now you've got something. Now you start, you make sure you keep doing that, because remember, the Spirit says, that, that people, there's going to be these doctrines, so people need to be warned against them. They need to be taught. They need to be trained up. Uh, if, you, if you were um, playing any sport, you know, you know what like, the scouting report is? You know what that is? When, when one team is playing another team, and then they have people that go check out what the other team does, and they take notes, and they keep track of it, and then they come back, and they say, hey, they've got a big guy. You know, he's really good at this. And, but this other guy, he can't do this at all. And here's a weakness. They analyze what the opponent's doing so that this team is prepared. And so the Word of God, it, it prepares us. I mean, how many times in our lives, because we're in the Word, and then something comes our way, and we're prepared for it? How many times have you been in your Bible in the morning, seeking the Lord, and then later in the day you think, man, I'm so glad I read that verse this morning? Because <laughs> it's not, a, it's not, it's, you know, it's not, hard to see because you think, I read that exact verse. I read that exact verse this morning about this situation. And look, here it is, man. God totally prepared me for it. So uh, the best scouting report is your daily time in the Word of God. (laughs) Just spend time with Jesus. So Timothy, as you're seeking to minister to the people, give them the Word of God. It'll be the best way to prepare them. Uh, And then in order to focus on that, verse 7, there's things you have to say no to. Verse 7, he says, reject profane and old wives' fables. Now, I don't know why people always pick on old wives. Um, Because that's actually an English phrase, right? An old wives' fable. We actually, that's part of our English vernacular. So I looked up these words in Greek to see if it was a different idiom. In Greek, it's old wives. Old wives. So apparently old wives have a bad reputation in several languages and cultures. An old wives' fable. Profane and old wives' fables. So how would you know if it's an old wise fable? Not, not all teaching is going to be of equal value. Now, I don't mean that not all scripture is of equal value. The scripture is all given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine. Hey, a time spent reading the book of Ecclesiastes is really a blessing. I mean, going through and looking at Solomon's 
analysis of his pursuits and realizing at the end that all of it was vanity, the only conclusion he had was fear God and do what God says. I mean, so, so that has value. But the book of Romans, man, that's Paul's clear teaching on justification by faith. So all the scripture is valuable. All the scripture, uh, we want to teach all of it. We've made a commitment to go from Genesis to Revelation. We don't skip any parts. We teach right through it. But old wise fables, Someone wants to speculate and say, well, you know, I've always wondered. And, you know, you could, you, if you were in a home fellowship and you started in the scripture and then someone shares their opinion, and, I've always thought this. And, I, and not and within a few minutes, you can be an old wife's fable. You can have walked the plank and no, you're no longer on the boat. You're going in another direction. It's very, very uh, easy for us to get off track. And so uh, part of spiritual leadership, if you're going to be wanting to be making an impact, is, is being able to grow spiritually to the point where you're able to discern, like, this is the most valuable thing. This is where we have to say, that's a really interesting thought, and we probably could dive into that, but, you know, this is what we're focused on right now. Let's keep going off in this direction. You know, that's, that's a sidelight. We'll save that for later. Um, you know, it, I think that uh, one of the things, we, we recently had the question and answer, and I was just so blessed by you guys, all the guys, all the people that were able to come out for that because we just had very few questions, almost no questions that, were, that weren't really valuable or about really substantive um, issues. I was just so, I was so blessed by the health of the church. Even, even the people were like, well, I just don't know so much. And I have so many questions. And then they asked a question. I would think, man, that's a radical question. <laughs> just really profound. Well, like this person's been reading their Bible and this is a legitimate, this is a really good question. And, and, but, you know, there's other kind of questions that are, you're like, well, I've always wondered, you know, and you're like, oh, great, you know, yeah, you know, you always wonder because that's old wives' fable. It's, it's you're, you're steering off course, and so what Paul's exhorting Timothy is being able to have discernment. Which one's more valuable, and what should you emphasize? That's very important. So reject those things, and instead put your energy into godliness. He says in verse seven, he uses now an analogy of exercise. He says, exercise yourself towards godliness. So if you want to be seeking the Lord, it's going to require effort on your part, like exercise does. Like, you know, uh, it's coming to the end of this year, and maybe there's some people who started their gym membership in January, and they were really faithful for half of January. And, you know, and they're getting ready to go, all right, January's coming. You know, it's time for me to get back into exercise. And it's the discipline. Exercise is something that just, it takes discipline. It's difficult to do. It's uh, you, you have to make sacrifices. You have to make it part of your routine. So Paul says, listen, the Spirit says this is going to be happening, so you need to be a good minister and help the people, so you're going to need to exercise towards godliness. You're going to have to have disciplines that are in your life that are going to lead you to be more godly. So what are the exercises that you would need to have? What are they? Well, you'd want to be in the Word every day. You'd want to pray regularly. Um, you want to be in fellowship, right? There's a few things, and you'd want to do them regularly. And obviously, this is the Sunday night cruise, so you're like, hey, man, I'm exercising right now. You know, I'm pumping some spiritual iron. I came back for Sunday night. But, you know, here's a person, you think of a person who comes to church twice a month on Sunday morning, and, and they read their Bible occasionally, so spiritually, if you could see what they look like spiritually, what would they look like? They'd look like me physically, flabby and out of shape. You know, think, man, you don't take the exercise very seriously. Oh, I take it seriously, I just don't do it. <laughs> I'm serious about not doing it. You can immediately see the effects when someone's not exercising, right? Um, exercise yourself to godliness. Put the effort in. Have the disciplines in your life. Do it on a regular basis. Um, verse 8, bodily exercise profits a little. So people that are super into bodily exercise, that's good. A little bit. It's a little good. You got something, that's good. But a godliness is profitable for all things. So a bodily discipline has a, has a little profit. You have more energy. You're healthier. You might even prolong your life. There's, so there's, there's advantages, and it's a, it would be good to do. But godliness, you can't even compare the two. Godliness, it's not an either or, but if you put them in comparison, remember discernment 
is discer discerning between what's a profane and old wise fable and actually what's good. So here, discern between these two, these two disciplines. Which one is more valuable? Well, godliness is profitable for all things, having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. And he says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. So the energy that you put into in your life, disciplining yourself, um, I'd encourage you to, to have a Bible journal where you write down how the Lord spoke to you and just do it every day. Make it a practice. So it doesn't have to be long. You don't have to be eloquent. You don't have to write it so that you're going to be published. You know? But just say, hey, this is what I read. This is what I think the Lord spoke to me. You know, this is what I'm praying for. And just have that as a discipline and just fill that thing and just write something every single day. Read your Bible every single day. And you might say, well, I just don't have any time. Just go... Pick up where you left off and read a few verses. How long does that take? Ten seconds. You can do it while you're eating your Apple Jacks or Lucky Charms or Fruity Pebbles. Remember, everything is good. Well, did he say good? Every creature of God. So I don't think Apple Jacks is a creature of God. It's a creature of man. There's, there's time to do it. You just have to make time. So it's a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. The exercise you put into godliness, you'll never regret it. It's profitable now and for the future. It'll make you a better husband, a better dad, a better wife, better mom, better coworker. Um, everybody will be blessed. And then verse 10, he goes, For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who's the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. And these things command and teach. So as Timothy's there, um, he's to be commanding people and teaching people to put energy into uh, godliness because um, Jesus wants to work in people's lives. We trust in the living God who's the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. That's an interesting phrase. The potential of Jesus being the Savior, he's the Savior of all men. There's no other Savior. If you, if you don't get saved by Jesus, there ain't no other way you're going to get saved. He's the only way to be saved. He's, he said that. His disciples said that about him. The Old Testament makes it really clear that there's one Savior to be looking for who's coming, and Jesus is that Savior. So he's provided for salvation for all men, but that salvation only comes to those who, who are believers. But the, the potential's there for everybody. So command that and teach that. And then verse 12, Timothy was going to be challenged in the culture that he lived in because of his age. He says, let no one despise your youth but be an example to the believers in word and conduct and love and spirit and faith and in purity. The culture that Timothy was in is much like many other cultures. Some cultures are more like this than others, but even our culture is like this. I remember uh, when I first became the pastor here, I was, uh, I was just about to turn 28 years old, and I, I look really young. I look younger than I am. I used to look younger than I am. So uh, I remember... Uh, over the years, many times, uh, we're leading, the worship team's leading worship, and then I get up to teach, and people would just look at me like, that's the pastor, and get up and walk out uh, more than once, several times. So it didn't hurt my feelings. I just thought, finally, we got some wise people in the congregation, but they left. They knew right away, like, that is the pastor. I'm out of here. I always thought, man, there goes everybody with discernment leaves. I'm sorry, I'm not talking. You guys have discernment but you're here. I don't understand it, but I'm glad you're here. Um, you know, sometimes people say, well, that's, just a, that's a young person. What are they going to tell me? Listen, we have little kids in our church. If a little kid came up to me and said, hey, Pastor Rich, I was reading in my Bible and I wanted to share it with you. You know, what would you think if you were, like for me as a pastor, if a little kid came up to me and said, hey, you know, I got, I got my first Bible and I was reading it and this is what I think God spoke to me. Man, I'd sit down and go, tell me, tell me, dude, I want to hear it. I, you don't, I don't think a five, I think a five-year-old could teach me. I would love it. I would love to hear what an eight-year-old thinks about the scripture. Why? Because it's the word of God. Man, any believer who's got the Holy Spirit can read the Bible and God can speak to them and they got something to share. If you got something to share and it's out of the word of God, then it doesn't matter how old you are. In fact, David said, said it like this in Psalm 119, and I don't think we want to take it beyond what he says, but he said, I know more than my teachers because I meditate in your word. I know more than the aged, the ancients, as I think the New King James says, or the Old King James. I know more than the ancients because I take heed to your word. It's that repetition of the word of God. 
He wasn't saying he didn't listen to old people or he was smarter than old people or old people are disqualified. What he was saying was the word of God will give you the wisdom that you normally get by doing dumb things. When, when you get, when, as, as you age, you have a, had a longer time to do stupid stuff. So you learned and you tell somebody, man, you don't want to do that. And usually it's because you did that and you think, man, that, that was a terrible mistake. As you go on in life and you get older, you've, you've seen a lot of people do a lot of dumb things. You've done a lot of dumb things. And it's just the wisdom of age. Or you've, you know, hey, this paid off. I did this and I don't regret it at all. There's just a wisdom that comes. But guess what? The word of God will give you that. You could be a dumb knucklehead. And if you just listen to what the Bible says, you're like, I don't have any gray hair. I just did what God's word said. I'm not smart at all. God just said, don't do that. So I did it. I just followed what he said. So um, some cultures, though, just will not listen to a young person. And uh, I've seen it. I think one of, the, uh, one of the challenges that we've had in Africa is we have a lot of young men who are really gifted, uh, great men of God, really. Some, some, some of the finest men of God that I know have gone through our Bible training in Ghana, and I, I respect them. I think if I ever died, you could replace me with guys that are 10 times that I am. They just live in Africa. I don't know. You could get them a visa to come here, but I could, I could give you a list of 20 guys that would be an improvement if I dropped over dead. Great Bible teachers. They love Jesus. Good guys, young guys. Uh, but in their village... They're just, uh, you know, just the way the patriarchal society, the older person, they just, those guys really uh, have a challenge to overcome because of just the nature of the culture. And one of the ways I think God's used us is, is even though I'm still young and maybe younger than some of those guys, because I'm a foreigner, because I'm white, and I'm a guest, uh, and they're, they're hoping for investment, you know, probably in the community from outside, that because then we can come in and, and it changes the guy's status in the community because he's connected to us. So it's, I think in some ways like Paul's Roman citizenship, you know, that there's a, just kind of a way that God's given favor um, in some of these areas. But I've watched, I just think, man, you don't know who, this, what a gem you have in your community that this young man is here and he's sharing the word of God with your people. It's going to transform your place. You need, you need to not disrespect this guy, but you need to listen to him because he's given you the truth of the word of God. So, so we want to be careful not to look at young people and say, what are you young people going to tell us? Man, if a young person is going to share the word of God, oh man, I want to listen. I want to hear the 12-year-old share a devotion. Oh my goodness, man. You read the Bible and pray. Tell me what you think that said. I'd love to hear that. How awesome. That would be the greatest thing in the world. Fresh set of eyes, you know, just a, a blessing. So encourage your kids in the same. You know, don't, don't, uh, don't look down on someone from their youth, but get... Get them into the word. Now, for Timothy's sake, what do you do when people are despised? I've always thought this is interesting. How does he do this? Don't let anyone despise. Hey, don't despise my youth. What are, you, are you despising my youth? Don't do don't, You better knock it off. I mean, how do you stop somebody from doing it? Thankfully, he tells us in the verse. What does he say? It's a key word for ministry, by the way. One of the most important words of all. Let no one despise your youth, but be in... Uh, what? an example. Be an example. So Timothy, these people aren't going to listen to you. They're going to dismiss you. They're going to go, what is this young guy going to do? So what are you going to do, Timothy? Don't quit. Don't let that stop you. What do you do instead? You just be an example. You just smile and say, well, yeah, I understand that. I understand why that must be hard for you. And you just quietly go about your business and you be an example of what? In your word. You share the word of God your own speech, your own way of communicating. You'd be a person of your word, but I think especially in just sharing the word of God. Just share the word of God, share the word of God, share the word of God. And do it in a way that's simple and clear and in the power of the Spirit. Uh, be an example in your conduct. Now, um, don't act like a lunatic or a crazy person. Um, have good conduct. Be an example in your love. Um, you should be... If you want to make an impact, you should, be, you should be loving. In spirit, be filled with the spirit. Be an example of faith. I think one of the things that can happen, uh, I, I've seen this happen two ways with, with people as they get older. Some people as they get older, they have more and more faith and they get more and more crazy for the Lord because they've seen God do so much. I've known some older people who are just such an encouragement because they've taken so many ventures of faith 
And you, you just say, I'm not sure about this. And then they just exhort. And they, oh, God will come through. And they're just so awesome. I mean, it's so encouraging. And then I've seen kind of the opposite. I've seen other people that as they got older, they became more afraid and they became more timid and they became more cautious and they became more closed because they've, they've seen it not work and they become cynical. And you try to talk to them, you go, what do they go? Oh, we try that. That, no, you're just young people. I don't know why you guys don't. You know, it's just, it's like one or the other, it seems like. So you be an example in faith. One of the things that young people can bring is a vibrancy uh, because of a zeal for God. So a young person that's an example in faith and also in purity. So Timothy, people might not listen to you in your culture. They might disqualify you. But, but here's a wonderful thing, because this applies to all of us that are in the workplace. All you guys that are in the workplace and people who don't want to listen to you and they've disqualified you. It may not be because your age. It might be for other reasons. They're just not open. So guess how are you going to reach them? You just be an example of these things. You be an example in your word, in your conduct. In, in spirit and in faith. Be an example of love. And, and what will happen is you'll impact them. And if they're disqualifying you in one way, but you're an example, they can't, they, nobody can argue against an example. They'll argue, they can argue with you, well, who do you, the Bible's written by men, or, you know, all those churches, how do you know which one is right? Or all the different excuses people give her. You guys are so narrow-minded, or whatever people say, but when you're an example of love, what do they say to that? You're the most loving person that they've ever met. You're the kindest person. You never say a bad word about anybody. That starts to stick out after a while. And if you're an example, as Paul tells Timothy here, in your own context, I think that you'll find that God will use you even if people try to disqualify you. And so verse 13, because remember he's to uh, instruct the people. Here's an exhortation in verse 13. Until I come... Give attention to three things, reading, exhortation, and doctrine. So as Timothy's gathering together with the congregation, what are they going to pay attention to? They're going to read the Bible. He's going to encourage them to follow the Bible. And he's going to teach them what the Bible says. So when you come to church, what are we going to be, paying, what are we going to be giving emphasis to? We're going to read the Bible. <laughs> We're going to encourage ourselves to follow the Bible, and we're going to learn what the Bible says. That's pretty simple. Doesn't that sound awesome? Doesn't that sound like a great church to go to? I'd like to go to a church like that. It's sad that it's hard to find a church that actually reads the Bible, or a place where you'd actually need to bring your Bible, or where they're actually going through a book of the Bible systematically so you could understand the Bible. But uh, I, I, just, I just love the simplicity of the ministry as Paul sees it. Then, specifically for Timothy, don't neglect the gift that's in you, which was given to you by prophecy and with the laying on of hands of the elders. So Timothy had received a gift. There had been prophecies. Some, as the elders had laid hands on him and were praying for him, someone had, had been able to speak what this gift was that Timothy had. And so, Timothy, make sure you use your gifts. And then verse 15, meditate on these things and give, yourselves in, give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. So if, if you're wanting to make an impact, so here's Paul's specific uh, commands to Timothy. Timothy, these things that I've just said to you, I want you to be preoccupied with these things. I want you to be focused on this. I want you to be something that you're giving yourself to. Meditate on it. When you're meditating on something, it's when you're thinking about it all the time. All of us meditate. Some of you might have been meditating while I was talking. Maybe you have a big thing coming up. Uh, I was, I, we have a young guy in our church who's getting married this week. I think he was meditating during the Bible study this morning. I saw him during the break, and he's just giddy. He's like out of his skin. He's so excited about getting married. I think probably right now he's meditating on it. Do you, you understand what I mean? That It's in his mind. He's mulling it over. He's thinking about it. He's processing it. So you're doing that anyway. So be careful and be wise about what you're meditating on. If you meditate on your anxieties, well, the Bible says don't do that. What should you be meditating on? Well, these things. The Word of God, what God's been saying, what God's doing. Just be meditating on that, and you'll, you'll make progress. Your progress will be evident to all. Isn't this an exciting thing about being in fellowship with each other, and you know people, and you watch them grow over a period of time, and you say, man, I remember when I first met you. How much have you grown? And that's you, how much, have, how much have I grown? Have I grown at all since you know me? I was, th I was looking at you, and I thought, you've grown so much, but I was just thinking, I hope... I've known you for probably 20 years, I think close to 20 years, and, and wow, how much you've grown since I've known you. And you're, just as you're walking with the Lord, you just grow. 
And sometimes you don't see it yourself, but other people are watching you grow and they, well, what do you, how do you grow? Well, you've got to be preoccupied with the things that make you grow, which, which is the word of God and fellowship. Exercise yourself for godliness. Make that a discipline. And what will happen is you'll grow. You'll grow. And then he ends with the encouragement that in Paul, it says this to all leaders, really. Um, and if uh, Acts chapter 20, when he's meeting with the Ephesian elders on the beach in Miletus, as he was traveling on his way to Jerusalem, he says the same thing to them. Take heed, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. The two things that we want to be paying attention to, I've got to take heed to myself and then to the, the message, the word of God that I'm sharing. These two things have to go together. My, what God's doing in my own life, I've got to take heed to myself. I've got to be on guard against the personal attack of the enemy against me. I've got to be walking in holiness. I've got to exercise my own self for godliness. I've got to be saying no to my flesh and, and saying yes to the Spirit, abiding in Jesus, letting the Word of God abide in me. I've got to take heed to myself. And then I, I take heed to, let's make sure we are staying in the Word of God. Make sure we're reading. There's good, solid encouragement in the Word to, to help people grow and, and good teaching. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. He says in verse 16, for in doing this you will save yourself and those who hear you. So very simple instructions for the minister. And this is true for the minister, but it's also true for the mom or the grandmother or the coworker. You want to be fruitful and you want to be working. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to function like a pastor, but you can be an example. All these things apply to the student in the classroom, to the mom in her house, to the, the person in their apartment complex. You're there. They might disqualify. They go, I don't listen to that person. Then be an example. They can't disqualify that. Just be the, just be spirit filled, be loving, be be humble, and and God will be using you. And and guard your own self, and and be in the Word yourself, and and share the Word, and and you'll save both yourself and those who hear you. So real simple teaching, um, for those that are in the ministry. It's interesting. I got a degree to be a pastor, and Paul makes it so simple. Four and a half years at a university, Paul like lays it out there pretty simple. But I'm a slow learner. I, four and a half years at the university and five years cleaning the bathrooms. So I'm, I'm, on the, I'm, a slow, I'm on the slow learner end of the curve, like Moses, you know, 40 years in the wilderness. So I'm not as slow as Moses. Almost. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the encouragement that comes to us by the Spirit from the Word, the, this word exhortation, the strength that comes, the direction that comes. I, I pray, Lord, that you'd inspire each one of us in the relationships that are around us in our homes, that wives in their ministry to their husband, husband in his ministry to his wife, uh, to children or parents, to children, children to parents, or, or in, in our our work environment, or here in the church congregation setting, whatever, wherever, wherever we find ourselves, Lord, help us to be an example. Help us, Lord, to be an example of love and an example in spirit, an example of faith. Help us to be that person that, that somebody would go to and say, man, I'm thinking about a step of faith, and we'd be the person to fan them into flame. Lord, help us not be those who pour water on the flame, but fan it into flame. And we thank you, Lord, for the warning about uh, the false teachers that will come. And we thank you that, Jesus, you're enough. And abiding in you is enough. And focusing on you is enough. And, and the, real, the only test case we need is, is this thing about Jesus or is it about this person? Is this thing about Jesus? What do they say about Jesus? What are they emphasizing? And if it's not you, then we can, we can, uh, we can discern it. We can look at it and see its value. So thank you, Jesus, for making everything about you so that we have a real simple test. And keep us, Lord, guard us, help us to be nourished and strengthened by your word on a daily basis as we exercise ourselves for godliness. And we pray these things in your name. Amen.